From anatomy to anesthesiology, from pathology to pharmacology, from microbiology to medicine, a one-man resource to the world of health sciences. Welcome to Dr. Paul's Medical Lectures. A practicing physician, Dr. Paul offers you essential insights on diseases afflicting millions of people around the world. For today's lecture, here is Dr. Paul. Good afternoon. This is Dr. Paul. Thank you very much for tuning to our channel today. This evening I want to talk about uh, organ transplantation. Now, this has been successfully done in recent years because of a great research that is done in this area. And the remarkable achievement is an excellent example of how, I mean, with all the problems we have, sometimes situations become so hopeless, but you could offer organ transplantation as one last resort to the patients dying of organ failure. So a variety of different types of organ failure could be today treated by organ transplantation. So it, doesn't, it not only offers improved long-term survival, but also improved quality of life for many patients dying of organ failures, whether it is kidney failure, liver failure, heart failure, lung failure, or even pancreatic failure, splenic failure. We have organs that could be transplanted. It is frequently the only treatment modality that offers a normal lifestyle for patients with advanced organ failure. So, uh, transplantation is very important. Let us see some of the basic transplants. Now, before I go further, I want to introduce you to three terms. Isograft, allograft, xenograft. So, isograft, allograft, and xenograft. Isograft is organ transplantation between genetically identical twins. When you do organ transplantation between two identical twins, I mean genetically identical twins, you call it isograft. But if you do it between dissimilar individuals, then you call allografts. So the most common type of organ transplantation is allograft. Then comes xenograft. Xenograft is uh, organ transplantation between two different species. For example, if you transplant uh, a pancreas from a cow to a human being or a pig to the human being, that is called xenograft. So isograft, allograft, and xenograft are the three most common types of uh, organ transplantations. Now, the most important uh, obstacle is to organ transplantation is rejection rejection of the transplant and that happens because of the immunological reactions so that's why we should always think about uh, uh, suppressing the immunological rejections when we transplant these organs so the allografts when they face these uh, active immunological attacks of the recipient's immunological system this organ transplant rejection happens and you need to suppress it how do you suppress immune system and that has been going on for a while but the first practical immunosuppressant was azathioprine azathioprine which is an antimetabolite inhibitor of DNA synthesis when used in combination with the corticosteroids this first successful combination of immunosuppression I mean, it, 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 it brought a revolution. Back in 1960s when only experimentally uh, done activity today became a big life-saving treatment because of the immunosuppressive agents that have been constantly developed in the, in the recent years. So you see, folks, immunosuppressant research is increasing. Today we could identify. So what is the main cell in organ rejection. It is T lymphocyte, right? So the T lymphocyte plays a very important role. It's actually the main agent that is causing organ transplant rejection. So today we have found many agents that inhibit the activation and proliferation of T lymphocyte. That's why we have this revolution in organ transplantation. And other treatments came, not like uh, azathioprine and uh, 
uh, corticosteroids that was the original combination but there are today other agents that came and these agents folks are doing a miracle I mean it's not perfect but the number of transplants we are doing have tremendously increased and the patients who have long survival like five years ten years on these transplants have also increased so there is tremendous uh, improvement in all of this. Now let's talk about uh, renal transplant. Renal transplant is usually done for people with uh, renal failure. What is the most common cause of chronic renal failure in the United States? It is diabetes. Diabetes amounts to like 45% of uh, all renal failure in the United States. Then comes hypertensive nephropathy. And uh, it's like 27% of people. And then comes chronic glomerular nephritis. So those three are the most common causes of uh, uh, renal failure. Diabetic nephropathy, hypertensive nephropathy, and chronic glomerular nephritis. So these three causes, they are the most common causes of renal failure. They are the most common causes of organ transplantation. I mean, liver, uh, the kidney transplantation. And in children... It's mostly congenital problems, including both like non-obstructive uh, congenital problem or obstructive uropathies, and those are the most common causes in children. Now, let's talk about uh, heart transplantation. And you know, the first successful human heart allograft transplantation was performed in 1967 by Christian Bernard, a South African surgeon. And at the time, however, the patient survived only a few days after the transplant because immunosuppressive therapy was only as of the and steroids. The regimen was inadequate to suppress the rejection. That's why patient did not uh, survive that many days after the transplant, but it was a revolution. Today we have more and more agents. And the introduction of cyclosporin in 1981, it caused a big revolution in heart transplant. Now today we have like 2,000 heart transplants, transplants every year performed just here in the United States. So today the uh, survival rate has increased. It's like over 85% of people survive more than one year. So the heart transplantation came a long way. Then heart-lung transplantation. It was introduced in back in 1981. Today if uh, patients with the primary pulmonary hypertension or congenital heart disease with uh, Eisenmenger physiology. So these patients, they do well, even with fibrotic lung disease with the cord pulmonary or cystic fibrosis. You can do heart-lung double transplantation, then lung transplantation alone. And it is currently performed for many different diseases and for things like uh, emphysema cystic fibrosis and pulmonary fibrosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and you can say even primary pulmonary hypertension, congenital diseases, so terminal CBPD. So these are very, very good candidates for uh, uh, lung transplant folks. And many of them live many years. And you need to give immunosuppressive agents to these recipients and it is very similar to heart recipients. But the corner stone is calcineurin inhibitor. So, so you give a calcineurin inhibitor in these patients. That's the corner stone. Because these patients, they do very well. And the other thing is acute rejection may be effectively treated with corticosteroid pulse therapy. So corticosteroid pulse therapy is very, very important in reducing the transplant rejections in uh, lung transplant patients. Now the most important uh, complication is the development of bronchioobliterance syndrome. That is called BYS, bronchioobliterance syndrome. The patients develop, it's very, very difficult to recover from that. So that is the major long-term complication of lung transplant recipients. So it is BYS. Remember that. Bronchiolitis obliterance syndrome. Bronchiolitis obliterance syndrome. That is the major 
complication of lung transplant recipients. So BOS is to felt to be the major manifestation of chronic rejection. Now let's talk about a few minutes about liver transplant. Today liver transplant is another transplantation which is performed annually in so many centers and patients are surviving like a one year like that rate is like 85 percent. The most common indication for liver transplantation is, remember this, it is cirrhosis due to chronic hepatitis C infection. Remember the point. The most common indication for liver transplantation is cirrhosis due to chronic hepatitis C infection. I mean, of course, you can do for other things like uh, uh, hepatitis B infection. That's a cirrhosis due to when the patient has cirrhosis due to hepatitis B. You can do it and then alcoholic cirrhosis. There is primary biliary cirrhosis. There is a sclerosing cholangitis. And there are autoimmune hepatitis. There is also cirrhosis secondary to uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So there are other things. And in children, the most common cause is biliary atresia. So if a child has biliary atresia, the best is to do, go for this liver transplantation. So you see folks, there are many good uses of liver transplantation. And the good news is many people are surviving many years. And current contraindication, there are contraindications. For example, if a patient is like uh, having cardiopulmonary disease, then you cannot do liver transplantation. So that's why you should always uh, see, look for uncorrected coronary artery disease in these patients. The patient has pulmonary hypertension with uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressures like uh, going more than 70 mm Hg or even if the lung problem like FEV1 less than 1 liter on pulmonary function testing, then you cannot do liver transplantation. Another absolute contraindication is like uh, substance abuse, active substance abuse. And other uh, contraindication I would say is diabetes. But if you can manage these patients, you can actually do liver transplantations even in diabetes, even in HIV. There are centers today doing liver transplantations even in HIV patients. It's no longer an absolute contraindication. Now, pancreas transplantation, the next one. Pancreas transplantation. And as you know, pancreas plays an essential role in insulin synthesis. So, if a patient has insulin-dependent diabetes and you are controlling them, like you are giving them insulin and you are giving them diet therapy, but as you know, the sad fact about diabetes is these patients relentlessly go towards uh, complications and they develop uh, nephropathy, neuropathy. And when that happens, it becomes very difficult to control their blood sugars. And many patients develop severe retinopathy. I mean, the losing the eyesight, losing, uh, getting the blindness people developing uh, nephropathy, ultimately ending up uh, renal failure. There is a peripheral vasculopathy, sometimes losing limbs like a leg. And so it's, it could cause a lot of mess. But the goals of uh, pancreas transplantation is primarily to prevent or delay end organ damage. You see, I mean, what happens if you give, if a, if a diabetic patient develop uh, hypoglycemia, their autonomic nervous system gets activated and they feel the symptoms and signs of uh, hypoglycemia like uh, uh, disorientation, dizziness and all that stuff. But when neuropathy happens, they lose that ability of autonomic nervous system. So when the patients develop diabetic neuropathy and lose autonomic nervous pathways that allow patients to recognize the symptoms of hypoglycemia, what happens? They develop hypoglycemia unawareness. Hypoglycemia unawareness. That means even when they develop hypoglycemia, they won't be, uh, become aware of hypoglycemia because their autonomic 
nervous system is not working and that's a dangerous situation for some of these patients go into coma because nobody does anything for their hypoglycemia. So these patients who develop a hypoglycemia and awareness, they do great on pancreas transplantation. Pancreas transplantation is great for these patients. And finally, I want to talk a few minutes about the cornea, corneal transplantation. And the good news is cornea is avascular. That means it has, I mean, it's, it, it's much easier to do a corneal transplant. And also the lymphatic system is not that great in the eye. So the immunosuppression, you don't have to do for a lifetime. All you have to do is to immunosuppression for one year. I mean, think of other organs, kidney and lung and heart, liver, for, for them you have to do it forever. But for corneal transplantation, you do the immunosuppression only for one year. And the take rate, I mean, the um, the organ transplantation rejection is very less for cornea because it is avascular and lymphatic system is not well developed. So those are the uh, important points I wanted to share with you this evening about organ transplantation. And please visit my website. And also I want to introduce you to this book, USMLE Smasher. Those of you who are appearing for USMLE and get this, this is a very good book for clinical skills, USMLE Smasher. And uh, it's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, on Internet, X libraries everywhere. So get this book, folks, and uh, that's about this thing. If you have any important points, please feel free to post them on the our website. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. For more medical videos, please visit us at www.drpaul.org and take time to browse through hundreds of health videos we regularly post on our site. If you are preparing for USMLE, PLAB, and other medical exams, make sure you visit our website to browse through our videos explaining the essential points you need to know before taking these examinations. For more information, visit us at www.drpaul.org. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.